All right, so if you're in this room, you are here because you want to hear somebody talk about how to build uh, testable PHP applications. Um, so I'm doing like a futuristic talk because I'm actually driving everything off of my iPad. So it's hopefully this all works. So uh, a little bit about myself. I wish I actually had the real knuckle tats, but I think I would have to do too many explanations to people about why I have them. A little bit about myself. My name is Chris Harchis. Um, I'm a long time, long, long time PHP developer. Been using it since 1998. Um, and I've built websites of all different shapes and sizes, from like a hack together personal blog to a really large online uh, cheat on your husband and wife while you're out of town dating site to um, the company I work for now um, called Cinecore, where we do content integration for really big telecommunication companies, ISPs. Um, Verizon is a customer of ours. And I work in the portal group where I make sure that we keep doing tests and all sorts of other exciting things. Um, I'm Canadian. I don't have the weird Canadian accent. Or maybe I do and I just don't know it is probably the more likely scenario. Um, I am so happy to be someplace that's warm because back home, I live just west of Toronto. Back home, the snow on the side of my driveways is this tall. Um, it's actually over the roof of my car. And when I back out into the road, I can't actually see um, who's coming. So I'm very happy. Uh, to be here in Miami. It's my first time in Miami. I've been to Florida before. Um, I took both my uh, long-suffering children uh, to Disney a couple years ago. So um, I'm, I do these tests because I don't want people, uh, in terms of testing, I don't want people to end up like, like good old Charlie Manson here, um, going crazy over the cult of testing. Um, my stance on testing has kind of softened over the years. I'm not quite so, I mean, I used to joke about like cutting people with knives over not testing and things like that. I've kind of soften a bit as, because um, you guys are in for a treat, this is the absolutely 100% last time I'm giving this particular talk. This is the 15th time I've done this talk at various conferences. So uh, I don't know what that means. It means that there's lots of people that want to know about testing or I need to get better at coming up with new talks. It's probably a combination of the two, but this is the absolute last time I'm doing this particular test. So how did I get started with all this testing? Um, I find with adopting any kind of new technology, there's usually just a moment where you go nuts and you end up flipping a table over something. Um, for me, it was back in 2002, early 2003, uh, when I was working for that dating site. It was a typical um, PHP spaghetti app of the time frame. You gotta remember, this is 2002, so um, PHP unit is not available. Um, nobody was doing frameworks. So most of your apps were just big, humongous um, spaghetti code, right? Business logic, display logic, all smushed the fuck together in, across several files. And I'm sorry, I swear, so I'm sorry if you're offended by my swearing. Um, I work from home. I've worked from home for a very long time, so I'm used to being able to swear. I don't even know what harassment in a home office consists of. I have, I have no idea. Um, so at some point, um, we were working on the app, and every time we changed something, something else broke. And um, I ended up working 120 hours of overtime in three weeks to get everything done for launch. And I said, number one, I'm never, ever fucking doing that again. And number two, there has to be a better way. I said to myself, there has to be some way that we can try to find all these problems before they make it up into production. And this was a medium complexity web app. It was an end tier type thing. So we had a bunch of web app servers and some middle tier caching stuff and a, uh, a very early um, a cluster of MySQL, and I learned that MySQL app replication lies, and we had slaves that were 30 minutes behind the master. So I, uh, it was a great place where I learned kind of everything not to do, and that's why this table flipping thing is very appropriate. So I, I, one, of my, um, one of the project managers at work had a copy of this pink book on his desk, and I was like, what is that thing, right? And it was um, one of the early versions of extreme programming, book, Kent Beck's book. And so I said, well, anything's got to be better than what we're doing now. So I started flipping through the book, and I discovered this thing on unit testing. I was like, oh, holy shit, this is exactly what I was looking for. So at that time, simple test was the only tool available in PHP, which is all um, browser-based testing. So I slowly got buy-in by convincing people that wouldn't it be better if we could track all these mistakes and catch them before the people who use our product find it? So over time, they did that. So basically, I've spent the last, and this is depressing, 11 years trying to convince people uh, to write more tests. So one of the things I, I like to also make people remind them about tests is that uh, one of the things I like to use tests for 
is to prevent future me, because one day I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up a brain in a jar, because I want to stick around forever um, on the internet. I, I tell my youngest kid, make sure when my brain's in a jar, turn it to face the sun, so I stay nice and warm. But I find that tests have a great way of protecting the future you um, from the present you that has no fucking clue what they're doing. So um, tests, tests are, a, you know, there's all sorts of reasons to write tests, but I, I find one of the better ones is that you're you're protecting you're protecting the future you from yourself by writing tests, and the tests act as documentation to try to make people understand how the app is supposed to be used. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, so this is a very common thing where people spend a lot of time. They want to write tests. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know all the stuff. I've done another talk that kind of talks about um, the meta game around. It. Anybody here play the the incredibly addictive and expensive card game, Magic the Gathering? OK, a few people. So in Magic, there's the idea of the metagame. You have the game itself, and then if you want to play at a slightly more competitive level, there's the metagame, so the game around the game, all the tips and tricks that you need to know, like what decks you want to build, what cards are good, what cards are bad. So there's almost a meta game to testing itself. There's, there's all these things that you have to learn um, in order just to get into unit testing. So in this particular talk, I'm focusing on unit testing, and at the very low level, some things that you can do at the code level to help yourself so that instead of saying 187 failed tests, you end up with a lot more passing rates. Um, now, of course, the whole topic of testing is rather large. Um, there are multiple books written about them. Um, since I'm a shameless self-promoting whore, um, I've written two of them. I highly encourage you to buy them so I can continue to, continue to travel and, um, and buy magic cards and not have my wife complain at me. Um, so I recommend books. But um, one of the things I have learned um, about testing is that some apps, they will resist um, your efforts to test. Everyone has worked with a really um, hairy legacy app that's using um, globals and, and magic quotes and all that stuff. And you know, you're using a dependency injection container known as the globals um, array. Um, some apps, they're going to, no matter how hard you work at them, you're never going to be able to get the level of testing because the architecture prevents you um, from doing so. But there are some things we can do. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, I think if you want to look at if you want to get into testing, so the first thing, it's about tools. There are a, a good, especially now, when I think about how it was when I first got into it, there was nothing. I had to, uh, I mean, I wasn't a good enough programmer to like write my own tools. Um, since I'm lazy and there's always other things I want to do with my time. Uh, I mean, I was big into Slashdot at the time, so there's always tons of stuff to read online. So I figured other smarter people than me um, who are a bit better coders would figure these things out. So to get into testing, we have to understand what some of the basic tools are. Um, and it's also it's about strategies, right? Um, the number one thing that people struggle with is learning the actual strategies of how to take, especially with legacy code bases, how to take a piece of code, look at it, and figure out um, the tests that you have to write and, and how you actually go about doing them. Um, so let's talk a bit about what does testable code look like. As an aside, um, I tormented my older daughter once with the, this is from Pulp Fiction, which is a pretty awesome movie. Um, there's a scene where he asks, you know, when Jules there asks, says to the guy they're about to kill, what does Marcellus Wallace look like? And then he does the what thing, and he starts yelling at him and says, say what, say what again. I did that to my oldest daughter once about, I asked her a question, and she said what, and I went going over and over and over again. And she said to me, do you do this to people where you work? And I was like, actually, yeah, I do. So, but just as an aside. Um, what, so what does testable code look like? Because the goal here is I want to show you kind of at the base level. Because clearly we only have an hour. I could do like a four-day workshop on testable code. So what are we looking at when we want to write code that's testable? Well, first of all, we want single-purpose objects. And of course, with PHP, all these testing tools only work really well with objects. So we want single-purpose objects. We want loose coupling between those objects, meaning that we want to try to minimize the dependencies. And we actually also want consistency. Uh, in architectural decisions. So when I talk about single purpose, we talk about, if you're familiar with solid stuff, single responsibility principle. Um, I mean, I think this could be summed up. Just because you can do it, uh, doesn't mean that you should. Um, we're wanting to create code that is, you have to, I find I often struggle with looking at, I'm trying to turn a problem into a bunch of objects that I can use to solve that problem. And I, I often struggle with making sure that my objects are single purpose, that I really drill down and isolate what they need to do. And I make sure that this object is solving this particular problem. Because then what that means is that you have smaller objects, fewer methods, um, fewer lines of code to read. And then uh, as a great side effect, 
fewer lines of code um, to test. Uh, if people were in Anthony's talk before this and saw some of the ridiculous end path um, complexity problems, if you focus on single responsibility, a lot of those things just simply go away because you take a, what's a big problem and chop it down to like four or five smaller objects that will all talk to each other to solve a problem. Um, empath complexity, like when he talked about, what was it, like you needed like a Greenland-sized um, iceberg of micro SD cards just to contain all the tests. Um, that's like a tongue-in-cheek example, but it really shows that the more complex your objects, the way more um, tests you're going to have to write. So I highly encourage you to like really look at your problem domain and try to break it down into, into smaller units. Um, so when we focus on this, we end up where the, our desired functionality is clearer, um, less methods to test, and also by focusing on single responsibility, um, chances are it's going to be more likely uh, easy to extend your code. Because part of this testing stuff too is that you're trying to, like again, you're trying to protect the future you from the present you. And if you make stuff that's very difficult to extend when you get requests, to uh, modify existing functionality. Because let's be honest, most coding these days is, it is maintenance programming. Where I work, I don't get to do any greenfield coding. I'm, I'm busy tweaking and, and uh, chopping at existing legacy applications. So we want to build stuff that if we do have to go back, and not, it's not an if, but when, when we have to go back and change things, we want to make it as easy as possible to extend. Um, because this is, I wish, I found this quote a number of years ago, and I, didn't, I stupidly did not write down who I could attribute it to. So um, like any good uh, internet superstar, I've claimed, the, claimed it as my own. So it's this idea that simple systems can display complex behavior, but complex systems can only display simple behavior. And here's kind of an example that's not PHP related. Um, a bunch of uh, artificial intelligence researchers um, wanted to simulate birds. So they created these artificial things that they called BOIDs, B-O-I-D-S. So they gave them three simple rules. They said, what's the fewest number of rules that we think we could give artificial birds to simulate um, flying? So they gave you know, three simple rules. One was like, don't go too close together. Um, pay attention to what orientation the other birds around you are doing. And also, whatever direction that they're going, try to uh, match them. And what they found with these really three simple rules, when they would create virtual environments for the birds um, to fly through, they found that um, it was really accurate in mimicking how real life birds fly in flocks and how they, and how they go around obstacles. So um, this to me is like a really great example of how a few simple rules will let your system do something really complex. And if we look at this imply of code, if, you have a, if your application consists of a whole bunch of single purpose uh, modules, what you end up doing is that you end up just writing little light layers of glue code to say I need this object and I need some stuff from this thing and I'm just going to compose. You almost build it, um, a good analogy is out of Lego. Good testable apps are almost built like Lego blocks of code. Um, so uh, part of, so this is about, and when I talk about architecture stuff, um, testable ones, there's also this one called the, um, the Onion Architecture, and this is a quote from um, Christopher Wilson. I, I found this, this blog post a couple months ago, and it really, uh, it really resonated with me. It's the idea that you're, by, also by going with these single responsibility things, you can organize your application in layers. And if you think of in terms of like a, a kind of a, a onion layer type scenario would be, um, your typical um, uh, web framework that's using like a front controller. People know what I'm talking about when I say a front controller. All the requests come in through one place. So in many ways, it's kind of like you're drilling through the layers of an onion. It comes in, and then you've got the request, and it gets handed out to the layer below, layer below, layer below. And then when you get to the part that's displaying things, it shoots things back out the other end. Okay? Um, like you said, you do this onion architecture that you make sure that code only knows about the dependencies that's, um, right, like it says, every layer of the onion is only coupled or dependent upon any layer deeper inside the onion. Because you're really, you're really talking about, um, if you want like a more uh, abstract concept of message passing. You're taking a message and just keep passing this message through layer, 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 until its final destination. And then it gets shot back out the other way. So um, I highly recommend searching um, for um, Mr. Wilson's blog. He goes into a little bit more detail. But again, I'm, I mean, I found it very interesting. And it resonated with me about how to build a bunch of single purpose objects. So again, like I said, basically, I, I really think if you follow building simple systems that you can um, you know, block them together like Lego, you end up with the experience of building apps looks like this, instead of this is what PHP applications sort of used to look like. Spaghetti and then lots of crying. Um, so uh, another reason to kind of consider simple things is there's um, Hoare's Law of large programs. Inside every large program is a 
small program struggling to get out. Um, I think programmers, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. Uh, we always claim that we don't want complexity, but our stuff ends up being complex for a variety of reasons. Some of them are, are ego-driven. Some of them are just um, we have to make decisions really quick. Um, so in many cases, you have a really good core of an application that's surrounded by a whole bunch of stuff. And I think from a, from a testing perspective, if you try to minimize all the stuff that surrounds it, you end up with stuff that's a, a lot easier to test. Because my, my focus is, uh, my brain has been wrecked by so many years of doing test-driven development that I find I have a very hard time focusing on a very large application and holding all the pieces in my head because I'm remembering other stuff like what time I have to pick up my kid from school and what magic set's coming out next week and I have to buy cards for it and uh, what my Blue Jays are doing in spring training and stuff like that. So my brain has gotten bad at holding big picture stuff. Smaller, uh, single purpose objects, I can instantly grasp what they're supposed to be doing. So consider the idea that you have a small application inside a large one and figure out ways to make everything in there small, I think is a good, good process, okay? But now we get on also in terms of building Tesla Labs is my favorite uh, topic um, frameworks. If you follow me on Twitter, you probably know that I, uh, much like Rasmus at the back there, I think all frameworks suck, but you need structure. And that's the main thing that a framework is giving you. It doesn't matter what framework, it doesn't matter if it's Laravel, if it's Symfony, if it's Zen, it doesn't matter. Your app needs structure. Um, but I think what I see a lot of people doing, and this leads to testability problems, is that the framework envelops your application like a giant killer squid, choking the shit out of it. And if you ever, I mean, really, I, I think the ultimate goal is that you want your framework to be an implementation detail, that you want all your business logic and all the things that are important to your application to be somewhere else and not coupled to the framework, because that way you can test all your business logic and rules and all stuff in isolation from the rest of the framework. And if you get really ambitious, um, you could always swap out the framework. You could like, I don't want to do Laravel anymore, I'm going to switch to Zend. And also more importantly, by separating things out and keeping your dependencies on a framework to a minimum. Um, who here has ever gone through like upgrading an application to like the next major version of the framework that it was built with? Okay. You know how painful that can be, right? So and that's another reason why if you look at a framework, the, really for me for frameworks, the I just try to use the basics. I try to use their routing layer um, and their uh, templating. And everything else I try to stay away from because I don't, wanna, I don't want the things that are important and potentially making money for whoever this application is for, I don't want them getting tied to the framework. So again, in terms of building testable apps, try to keep your um, reliance on the framework to a minimum. Always think about separating out your business logic. Try to keep, keep as much stuff away from the framework as you can. And I know some frameworks make it difficult, but it is, it's uh, definitely worth the effort. So I know I've been talking all about all sorts of theory, and I'm sure a bunch of you are bored, so I'm going to try to entertain you a little bit more now. So some of the concepts, computer science concepts, that we have to learn in order to get comfortable with building testable applications is the law of Demeter. This quote comes from my favorite programming book of all time, which is The Pragmatic Programmer. Who here has read it or owns a copy? Okay, not enough of you. Um, I'm on my second copy of the book. My first one fell apart from being dog-eared and... I spilled water all over it one time. Um, it's, I highly recommend the book. I, re, I refer to it constantly to kind of remind myself of what it means to actually be a, a good programmer and remind myself of like the, I know I talk about the meta game and I'm big about meta concepts, about the meta concepts as a programmer that I need to pay attention to so that if I have to switch from language to language, because where I work, it's mostly, I do mostly PHP and some JavaScript, but we have systems written in Perl and uh, I snuck some Google Go stuff up into production we have Java services, we have Perl, we have all sorts of stuff. The concepts, the meta concepts of programming and building testable things are portable from language to language and even from framework to framework. So I highly recommend spending time learning the higher concepts. So one of the key concepts I believe for building testable apps is understanding the law of Demeter, which is really about loosely coupling things and reducing dependencies. Um, because um, because the law of Demeter leads to the concept of dependency injection, and I know dependency injection is like a big scary word, but um, most people have used it, and it's probably also more commonly known as um, passing parameters around. I mean, at its most basic level, when someone talks about dependency injection, you are literally, you're writing methods for your objects that accept parameters that act as dependencies. I, I know people like to throw around words like service locators and dependency injections and all that stuff. No, no, don't be a dick. It's just passing parameters around, right? 
Um, so let's talk a bit about it. So a more formal, uh, formal definition of dependency injection. Pass objects and their methods, other objects that are required, if we're looking at it from PHP, from object-oriented perspective. Um, and here's, can people see that at the back? I always worry that the code samples look terrible. They look okay at the back? Okay. So here's a very, um, this is a, a theoretical website where people can access uh, stolen credit card numbers. And so we have an ACL object where we want to make sure that only people that have paid us in Bitcoin can come in and see the credit card numbers. So we have this code with access allowed, and you can see that we're grabbing our request object, and we're, we're passing stuff in. We're passing the URI in, and we're making sure based on the person's user level in the session, do they have permission to see it? And then somewhere inside our controller, we create a new ACL, and we check. Okay? And this is very kind of standard stuff that you see all over the place. So what would we need to do to this code if we wanted to test it? Well, the first thing that we would do is that if you notice, you know, is it going to let me go back? Nope. Okay. So, ah, stupid thing. Technology sucks. Okay. The key thing to look at is, um, is inside here. Okay. One of the key things about dependency injection is that you're writing your code in such a way that your methods, you, t you tell them how to use something. You don't tell them how to create the thing that they're going to use. And I know it's like a really subtle concept. But it just basically means that anywhere you see a new, like a you know foo equals new whatever, that's a that's a dependency, and that should be taken out of the method, and you should find a way to pass it in. It's it, again, people think testing is complicated. Uh, it, it's a lot of work, but it's not really that complicated. Because if it was that complicated, I wouldn't have been able to figure it out. So let's let's look at a very simple example of how we would fix this. So the first thing, one of the methods that I like to use is um, is constructor injection which simply means that I figure out all the dependencies that my object needs, and then at runtime, I pass those dependencies in via the constructor. So in this example, you can see that I've added a constructor method that accepts the request and the user level. We set it to internal um, attributes of the object, and then, we, and, and then there's other code in there that manipulates those things. And you can see inside our controller, we now have a slightly different call where we're passing in our request and passing in the user level. Again, that's it. That's all there is to it to making code that you can test, that you can inject dependencies into. Now, I'm, I like using um, uh, construction, constructor injectors. Some people like who maybe are refugees from uh, the Java community like to use getters and setters all over the place. You can do setter injection as well. So this is just a very basic example of setters. I, I prefer constructor injection, but there are times when I've done stuff with setters um, I don't think there is a wrong way to do it. As long as you are injecting your dependencies in, I will be less grumpy. Um, so, so the next concept from testing that we need to understand is, is the idea of test doubles. Um, at a very basic level, test doubles are about creating copies of existing objects for testing purposes. And it's, a, it's an essential thing to do effective unit testing. I, I don't think that you can write... Um, I don't think you can write unit tests that use objects that are not just simply, um, excuse me, that aren't just simply like data value objects if you're like into entities and stuff like that. I really don't think you can write effective unit tests without using mocks. I know some people don't like using them, um, and I've seen examples that make sense of when not to use them, but for the most part, if you're going to be writing unit tests for your PHP code, you're going to have to mock things so you can create scenarios where you're in complete control of the state of all the objects that you're going to use. So I'm going to talk a bit about test doubles. So what are some of the things that uh, I find myself creating test doubles for over and over again? Well, um, big one is database connections. And I have a little rant about database connections in a, a slide or two. Um, web services, um, file system operations, and more importantly, other objects or test under code uh, needs to use. Um, for my own personal experiences of learning how to test, I felt like I didn't really understand the the enormity of the task of testing certain uh, code bases until I learned about uh, test doubles and all the different kinds, and also discovering which sort of test doubles um, PHP units built and stuff can handle and which it couldn't, uh, which does make a difference on the type of test that you want to run. So, um, so what do I use? The tools that I use? Um, I use PHP units built-in support. Um, if you've ever seen code with get mock or get mock builder in it, that's the built-in stuff. However, over time, I have found myself more and more using um, Patrick O'Brady's awesome mockery 
um, library. I have found that there are certain types of tests that I'm trying to run um, that the built-in PHP unit stuff just doesn't handle properly. Um, I think it's because I'm starting to want to write tests that use the concept of test spies, where I'm trying to verify that in a chain of, uh, like when I, you know, I'm executing a particular scenario and I want to make sure that specific methods of an object are getting, um, are getting executed. I want to verify, like, if I pass in an array uh, is, in one of my mocks, is this one method being executed five times? Because I know it should be done five times. I, I find that um, PHP units built in stuff makes that extremely difficult. And mockery makes that super simple. Um, I did a screencast for somebody. It's actually going to go up pretty soon through Pluralsight. I was very happy to do some work with them. Um, where, yeah, it took me, I, was, I spent almost 90 minutes trying to solve the problem using PHP units built in stuff. I solved it in five minutes using mockery. So um, there are, again, certain types of tests that mockery excels at. Um, if you're into um, PHP spec, how many people here have done any work with PHP spec? Okay, just one or two people. Not quite as common. Um, they discovered that they needed some mocking stuff uh, to work with PHP spec. So they invented prophecy, I believe. Well, don't quote me, but I believe prophecy is also compatible with PHP unit, I think. But I really think it's either using the built-in stuff or um, you use mockery. I've started migrating more and more to mockery. Um, plus, Patrick's a great guy, and I'm happy to support his project, too. Um, so let's talk about an example of creating a mock for something. So this is our, our code from before, where we're using constructor injection to inject our dependencies. So if I wanted to write a test for this, um, how to go about doing this? And this is actually a very common thing that I go through um, with legacy code bases. Um, like I said, I'm a big believer in test-driven development, but I also find if you're working with a legacy application, TDD is really hard because you might, if you're not, if you have a very large code base and you're not really familiar with it, um, you may, you may find that you actually have to implement solutions first and then go back and write the test afterwards, which of course is like heresy for real, true test driven development. But the goal is actually to, at the end of the day, is to have tests, which would make me, again, less grumpy. So let's talk about, this, again, this is a very simple example. How would I go about doing this? So any test where you're using test doubles, your test in inevitably looks the same way. You have a whole bunch of stuff at the beginning of the test where you're mocking and creating test doubles for all your dependencies. So sometimes it's like I'll have like 50 lines of setup and then three lines of actual testing. So this is just using the built-in stuff is a very, very simple example of how you use the built-in functionality. Again, um, it's just you're basically telling the system, I want you to create a, a, a double of this grumpy controller request object. We're going to disable the, the original constructor because sometimes you have objects that um, the, in the constructor, there's a whole bunch of side effects. And when I mean side effects, it means that um, code that's executed that may modify something else. So many times you want to disable that, um, uh, the original constructor and then get a mock back. And then for every method, I'm telling you, when on the my request object, when the get URI method is executed, I want you to return this value. So again, I know I talk about the meta stuff. At a high level, all you're doing with the test W is saying, give me a fake object. And when these methods are executed, I want these values to be returned. So again, when explained this way, very simple concept. When you're looking at the PHP unit documentation for the first time, incredibly intimidating. Um, I, I just wish I had someone else to show me. Uh, in one way, you're lucky that people, that I can come up here and show you how to do this stuff, because I had to figure all this shit out for myself. And I found a lot of it extremely frustrating until I found people who were willing to explain to me how these things work. So again, this is a very simple test. I create these mocks. I create uh, a real copy of the thing that I'm testing. I execute my method, and I assert that I'm supposed to be getting back a true. So this is, when it comes to mocking things, this is all it is. Um, so if you follow proper, or proper, I guess, object-oriented design, and PHP people love to do this, um, you'll have um, protected and private methods and protected and private um, attributes or variables or whatever you, or whatever you want to call them. Um, these are difficult to test properly. Um, I mean, the main reason is just simply accessibility. Like people mark methods as protected and private for a reason. They're there as like kind of a warning to the developer. Don't access these things directly because chances are they're going to be um, accessed by public methods inside that call it. So, if you, do, if you are in a scenario where you have to test a protected method, there's a few things, concepts you have to learn. Um, for those that work at Etsy, where Erasmus works, they put a ton of work 
into some extensions. And one of them is for PHP unit that um, you can use annotations to mark your code. When I say annotations, are people familiar with what I mean by annotations in the code? Okay, who here has used like PHP doc blocks? Okay, then you know what annotations are. At and then something inside the doc block. Just as, that's all you do. Um, so you use, you use annotations in comment blocks above your protected and private methods to mark that you want this thing to be testable. So here's just a really simple example. If you had some object and you just put that, um, that annotation above it. And then um, what happens is that when you run the test, and it kind of looks something like this. Um, you put some stuff into your setup method for your PHP unit test case that you want to load this accessible object helper, and then um, you run these things. So, but what it's doing behind the scenes is actually it's using the reflection API. Who here has ever used the PHP's uh, reflection API? Okay. So basically, what all these things are doing is it's trying to it's basically trying to hide from you the fact that it, when it's creating a test double, it's taking an object. Um, and then using the reflection API to make ev to make that specific method publicly available. So in a way, it's kind of cheating a bit. I guess it takes this thing and says, "We'll make a copy of it, and, we'll, and don't worry, bro. We'll make everything public, so you'll be able to test it." So that's kind of what it's doing. Which is, I mean, it's unfortunate that we have to kind of contort ourselves to test private and protected things. Um, I do still write code that uses protected and private methods. But instead of, instead of doing, having to do things like this and, and bring in other dependencies into your, into your testing toolkit, I just make sure that I test my public methods that exercise the, the private and protected methods. And then I use code coverage to make sure that um, I've covered them properly. Um, code coverage reports are another thing that I think not enough people that do testing um, take a look at, especially if you, um, if you install Xdebug and you get the really awesome code coverage. Take a look at those at the things that Anthony talked about: the cyclomatic complexity, the crap index, the end path. Take a look at the code and, and make sure that you're covering things and get an understanding of when things are getting out of hand. So, um, there's a good blog post up here for the Guelph um, PHP Users Group back in Canada. Um, I'm going to post these slides at some point. I have to figure out how to do it from my iPad later, but they'll go up someplace and then I'll tweet when it's available. Um, same thing. Just some simple examples of using the reflection API to turn things um, public. You can see, for example, we have a method that says, that's protected and it, and it sets a message to write tests or cut you. And if we wanted to test it, again, we do all this setup work um, to make something with the reflection API that we can then test. Very simple. Okay, so this is my kind of final thing about the public, about public, about private and protected. I suggest never testing them directly. Make sure you test the, the public, publicly available methods. Because then again, you don't have to do all that other shit. I mean, life is short. There's other stuff I want to do than constantly writing boilerplate to reflect objects. Okay, so now another contentious issue, databases. And for databases, you could substitute data store, third party API, whatever, some place where you're stuffing data. Um, a lot of people try to take the shortcut of saying, oh, I'll just create a database um, for testing purposes. Um, that's wrong. Uh, from a unit perspective, from a unit testing perspective, it's the wrong way. Okay, um, because when you're introducing another dependency to the test in having a database that's available, you want to have to tell your boss, "I can't run my unit test because the staging database server is down." I mean, I, that's um, it's not a bullshit excuse, but chances are your boss is going to say, "Well, then you better make sure the staging database is back up um, by using test doubles." Um, you eliminate this. That you're, you're no longer, because when you write these tests, you, you end up actually writing a test to make sure that your database server is working. So you're kind of writing a hybrid unit and integration test. And to be perfectly honest, if your database isn't working, well, your whole app is screwed anyway. So you should probably be trying to eliminate the availability of a database as a dependency for your test. So it's, it's actually not that hard to write code uh, that mocks database connections. I do it all the time. Like I said, I really feel that if you're actually using, I know that Sebastian wrote DB unit. I just philosophically feel like I shouldn't be using it. If you want to use it, that's okay, but I still think it's, it's wrong. So because it's a constant struggle when we're doing the test, right? Spy versus spy. I'm an old guy. I'm 42. I remember uh, Mad Magazine um, as a kid and spy versus spy. The struggle between integration and unit tests. People want to write tests and they want to test real things. And I try to get people to understand we have unit tests on one side, 
which is we're making sure that individual units of code are behaving the way that we expect. And then we have the integration tests, which are trying to make sure that uh, modules of code talk to each other properly. They are two separate things. You need to treat them differently, which is why I get ranty about database stuff. So if we wanted to do it, how could we do it? Here's an example of code that's using um, a database object. It's probably PDO or something. I don't know. I just made up the examples for the slide. Um, uh, we have clearly were able to inject um, the database into an attribute, and we run some code. So if I wanted to write unit tests for this, it probably would kind of look a little bit like this. And, this is, and I think this sort of thing also illustrates why people uh, will almost instinctively say, why don't I just use a real database? Because look at all this setup stuff. This is all the setup stuff that we're doing before we've even executed our code, right? We have to create a mock database object. We have to mock the query that we get back. We have to mock the, um, um, the binding of parameters so we don't get uh, SQL injections. Um, we have our execute. So we basically have to take everything that the database, your object that represents the database is doing, and mock it, all for the purpose of avoiding using a real database. And I know that sounds dumb, but don't use a real database. Um, and then this is our actual code. We have a new object. We're using um, setter injection to pass in our mock database. And again, we just execute our tests and then do an assertion. Um, also, one of the things I, I forgot to talk about during the dependency injection thing is that one of, the, one of the interesting kind of side effects of writing code that relies on dependency injection is that you are able to fake the code out, to pass in um, mocks of things. And the code, know, you know, your methods know how to use stuff. They don't even care that it's not real. Um, and you know, I, I think that's, again, as a high-level concept, that my mind went, oh, that's a very interesting idea to think about that. You're writing code that, can, that doesn't care um, about whether the thing is real that's being passed into or not. And also, now that I think about it too, another reason to not use a real database is that there is overhead associated with using a real database for testing. So think about this too. So, um, so chances are you have a database for production. And if you're lucky, you have a database for staging. So now you have the problem of making sure that you have regular uh, updates from production to staging. Then if people have databases for testing purposes, now you have to also have somebody whose job it's going to be to make sure that data gets regularly updated from, goes from um, production into the test ones. And also, and this is a, a very true thing, developers have blind spots about the code that they work on, especially when they're testing. They, you might find yourself actually subconsciously not testing stuff that you know is complex because you might be saying, well, I'm going to go back and I'm going to clean this up later, or I really have to get this done. I'm positive my boss will let me go back and fix this. So you end up with like little subtle blind spots. And you don't, you don't test things fully because, um, because your brain is sabotaging you into trying to get the job done as quick as possible. So with the database stuff, you know, have the, uh, also have the added complexity that you will have a database that chances are does not, is not representative of what you even have in production. I mean, anybody who's written a large number of, of unit tests that involves storing stuff comes up with pet data sets, stupid names. I always use uh, Testy McTesterton, and I use Art Vanderlei, and I use also other pop culture references in my names. Our real data that are, that are customers for our app, is, it's not going to look anything like that. So, uh, so you have the added complexity of needing to constantly updating your um, test databases. So again, what do you think is more work, writing a bunch of code to mock the databases, or once a week, having to figure out how to automate a script um, to download a very complicated uh, database schema and update something. I would rather write that stuff. And so so uh, another great thing um, for mocking that helps is uh, for API calls, third-party API calls. One of the techniques I like to use is I always like to use um, wrappers around things to extend the functionality of the API that I'm using. And often they end up looking um, just like pass-through things. So here's an example of. Um, we're, we're talking to a hipster API so we can find out about bands that sold out after we started liking them. So um, we have this thing that's doing a call, and then I want to extend some functionality to like create some, uh, uh, get some totally restful HADOS hypermedia response when anybody wants to find out about the bands I no longer listen to. So I would have my, my hipster API object. I pass into the wrapper. Some of these things are just passed through. Sometimes I'm going to take the results and manipulate them some way. So, Doing it this way where we're injecting the real API into our wrapper, it makes it super simple to write tests because all we have to do is mock the, create a mock of the API. And again, the wrapper just knows it's being given something. 
that says it's the hipster API, and it already knows how to use it, so it doesn't care that it's not real. It doesn't care that it's not really making a call um, out to a rate-limited API because um, you know, um, they're too busy uh, playing kickball on Tuesdays to keep the API up for you. They don't care, right? The thing just doesn't care. So, uh, so again, with APIs, especially as more, as, as more and more APIs and really useful APIs become available, um, being able to mock them and have your tests not care and not need to actually connect to the outside world becomes very important. You want your unit test suites to be fast. You want them to be as quick as possible. Um, where I work, our unit test suite is in the hundreds of thousands of tests, and I think it takes about 15 minutes for the whole thing, for every single PHP-based uh, test to run. And that's not too bad. We have a few kind of pseudo integration tests in there as well. But one of my experiences was when you had a, um, a bunch of tests that were more integration than unit, um, the test suite would take forever to run. And most developers being lazy, they're just going to write the test and only run the test for the code that they've been changing. And they're only going to, the, the longer the overall test suite takes to run, the less likely people are going to run it. So you'll have this mad rush at the end of your sprint or whatever your deadline is of everybody trying to run the entire, um, the entire test suite. And I remember, uh, not fondly, of the test server crashing always on the last day of the sprint because everybody was trying to run all the tests at once. So again, another reason to keep your tests away from talking to real things and talking to mock stuff. So again, this is just an example of the test of the second half of the test. Again, it's, it's very simple. You, you find these things are, uh, they, not, they don't become intuitive, but you start doing, I mean, humans are really good at like pattern matching and mapping. I mean, you know, it's stuff like how many times you walk around, you see somebody that looks like somebody that you know. That's just our brain always trying to match patterns. So I find in terms of test, I see these same patterns, and I know that I can cut and paste from another test somewhere and just tweak the few things I need to tweak to get it to work. Um, so another thing um, when you're building testable apps is environmental concerns. Um, your app shouldn't care what environment it runs in. Um, what I mean is that often I see um, applications that there's like flags and guards around the stuff that says, if we're in development, do this. If we're in staging, do this other thing. And if we're in production, ignore all this other stuff and do something else. Um, I find those to be error prone and, and, uh, and really not necessary with a little bit of work. Um, one of the neater tools that I found to help with this was a thing called php.env um, by Vance Lucas, who's also done, uh, any people here heard of the bullet PHP functional framework? Yes, no, maybe not, okay. Um, Vance has done some stuff and he ported the Ruby uh, .env stuff over to PHP. And basically what it lets you do is you can define a whole bunch of um, um, uh, configuration files that are dependent on the environment. And then in your, and if, since most people are using kind of the modern um, bootstrapped framework these days, you can just load the appropriate um, environmental environment file um, in your bootstrap. And then the application, again, knows where it can go to find out information, but doesn't need to, doesn't need to be told, I'm in production, I'm in staging, I'm in development. Um, Another option, too, if you don't want to go down the route of uh, php.env, is you could just use um, old school INI files. Um, back when I used to work with Ben Ramsey, who's doing a modern PHP talk, um, we had a deployment tool called Whiskey Disk that uh, actually had this really good idea where it separated the application from the configuration files. And so that whenever we need to make a, a configuration change, we would just push the configuration repo instead of the application itself. So when you're looking at your apps, think about how can I separate things out and how can I make it as simple as possible for the application to understand what environment it's running in. Because by figuring out how to isolate the environment, um, you get rid of the, the weakest excuse ever is that, well, the code works on my machine. Those, those are the things that we totally want to eliminate. And, and one of the ways that we can eliminate that is by the use of virtual machines. How many people here use Vagrant? That is awesome. I'm a firm believer in it. Uh, at Cinecore, they, they, we use virtual machines for our development. However, they are not on our, on our development machines because they're actually too large and have too many dependencies. They built their own network of, of virtualized dev servers before Vagrant and everything else came out. I highly, highly recommend um, working as hard as you can and screaming as loud as you can to your bosses to be, be allowed to use Vagrant for development work. Because if you fuck up a machine, you just delete it and install a new one and you don't have to worry about it. I mean, I've worked places where all the developers 
had little sandbox areas and people were sharing the same machine. And that would sometimes lead to some like really weird and subtle errors that would only appear in development and never appear in production. So you would write tests for scenarios that only existed on staging or development, but would never ever happen in production, which is extremely weird. Um, so we are almost at the end, and I know you guys are probably looking forward to getting some lunch. So where did I learn about all this stuff? I started so long ago, back when the world was black and white, and I had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to get to work. Um, I had to learn all these things myself, and I, and I know you're going to be shocked by this. I would mercilessly harass people who knew what they were doing uh, about how they learned these things and how they figured it all out. So to give you guys a shortcut, where do I learn about this stuff? Well, of course, there's Twitter. Uh, if you're not on Twitter, I understand. My wife often wonders why I'm on Twitter all the time. Um, Twitter is actually a great way to, to ask people questions, and then people can follow up via other um, mediums of communication. Um, these days, I, get, I feel, of course, because I put myself out there as, as a, a testing expert or guru or testing asshole or whatever you want to call me, um, Twitter is the number one way that people get a hold of me. And um, I do read every tweet. Um, I end up blocking about one person a day over aggressive comments. Um, but ask. Basically, Twitter is a great way to ask people. Quick little questions. Can you tell me where you found this thing? Can you give me a link? I'm looking for a book on a particular topic. Um, so again, Twitter. Um, I'm Grumpy Programmer on Twitter without the U. Um, if you have any questions about anything, please hit me up. I'll try to answer them. Um, if you want longer, more uh, complicated but interactive um, explanations on things related to testing, go into IRC. Um, Freenode is awesome for that. Um, I hang out in the PHP mentoring channel because I'm big in the, in the mentoring scene where I've tried to help people out. Um, Jeff Carruth, is he in here? Where's Jeff? Okay, so he's, he's not here. Okay, um, Jeff Carruth is one of the guys I helped um, mentor and get him up to speed on um, testing stuff. And I won't lie, I feel pride that people that I've taught stuff have gone on and they're busy building up their own career and promoting testing stuff and getting other people learning. So. IRC is a great way to have, a, to have an actual conversation with somebody, not a bunch of little snarky comments um, and jokes and pictures of cats on, um, on Twitter. And, but of course, there is the, also the uh, longer form one where um, email is really good. I do get a lot of emails from people, and, and I try to write um, very long explanations. Um, I do read every single email that I get sent that's not flagged as spam. Um, I don't always answer them, but I read everything. So now we're into the self-promotion part of my presentation. This is a book that I wrote, The Grumpy Programmer's um, Guide to Building Testable Applications in PHP. It's a very long uh, title at uh, grumpytesting.com. A lot of the things that I talk about in this presentation are in this book in more expanded form. Um, and then after I wrote this book and I had lots of people asking me, so how do I actually use PHP unit to do some of these things? So then um, I wrote another book, uh, The Grumpy Programmer's PHP Unit uh, Cookbook. And as an aside, this awesome shirt that I'm wearing that is actually an elephant, my mom got this for me for Christmas. She took the cover art and sent it to the t-shirt person and said, can you make me a t-shirt with an elephant on it? So um, that was kind of cool that my mom was uh, nice enough to try to get me uh, a gift related to what I do for a living. So this book goes through very common scenarios with PHP unit, how to accomplish um, specific tasks, along with examples and explanations of how I do it. Um, um, to be perfectly honest, you can buy my two books, two e-books, for $40, um, you will get way more than $40 uh, out of your career by having looked at these things. And these are kind of like the gateway into doing more advanced testing stuff. If you think about 40 bucks, you may be able to save your company thousands of dollars in lost productivity. Um, so, and also a new thing that I've started doing over at my Grumpy Learning website, I've started doing screencasts. Um, they are not free because I like paying my bills. and. Um, I'm starting to do more advanced and long form screencasts. And the good thing about these ones is they are very lightly edited. So you hear me working, swearing, making mistakes, looking things up, writing code, deleting it, accusing myself of being dumb, trying to test again and getting it to work. Um, I think it's, as a next level thing about testing, I think it's really important to try to find, uh, to try to find people who can actually show you. Because you can go to this session and you can go to like a tutorial at PHP Tech, or you can go someplace else, and you can, you can hear someone or listen to someone talk about these things. Um, it's not the same as actually seeing someone that knows what they're doing and having them explain to you 
why we're doing these things, the decisions that are being made. Um, with these videos, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. I want to show people, here's how you actually go about doing these things. So that, again, I'm trying to turn what is, can be really intimidating into something broken down into small, easily digestible chunks. Uh, so um, thank you for all your attention. You can find me on Twitter, uh, Grumpy Programmer without the U. Uh, you can email me anytime, chris at uh, grumpylearning.com. Uh, I'm always hanging out on Freenode. I'm actually Grumpy Canuck on um, Freenode. Um, so thanks very much for your attention, and I'm glad everyone came out today. Thank you.